When you have the homeowner's undivided attention to listen to your assessment of the home's attic ventilation, what will you say? You're a home inspector or a roofing contractor, and you've made some self-observations about the attic ventilation. What exactly will you be telling the homeowner? Hi there. Welcome back to another episode of our podcast, Airing It Out with AirVent. My name is Paul Shelsey. I host AirVent's in-person Attic Ventilation Ask the Expert seminars offered every winter to roofing professionals all across North America since 1998. Today, we have five key points about attic ventilation every homeowner should be aware of. To help us explain them and why they are important, let's welcome to the show Sean Bellis, owner of Epic Exteriors in Overton Park, Kansas. Hello, Sean. Morning, Paul. How are you doing? I'm doing well, Sean. Thank you for joining us on our podcast. Thanks for having me again. I appreciate it. I think uh, we were one of the last folks that you visited in the seminar series in Kansas City. We were the last stop. So yes, it was. Nice yes. Again. Good to see you, Sean. Thank you. I, I've known Sean for many years. He helps AirVent write best practices articles for industry publications. He regularly shares photographs from the field, highlighting either mistakes to avoid or tips to make things easier or better. And he's a frequent participant in our educational seminars. As he just mentioned, Kansas City was one of our final stops during the first quarter when we do our seminars and then we had to shut things down because of COVID-19. Thank you, Sean, again for joining today. Sean, let's go through the five key points about attic ventilation and why the homeowner should care. Here we go. We'll start with number one. Key point number one for the homeowner, attic ventilation is essential for your roof. Sean, research shows that proper attic ventilation can deliver year-round benefits, specifically help to fight heat buildup, moisture buildup, and ice dams. Let's dig just a little deeper, and we'll start with heat buildup. In the summer months, getting the built-up heat out of the attic pays off by helping to make the living area cooler and more comfortable because you have less heat from the attic radiating into the living space. This lightens the burden on the air conditioning system and could lead to lower electricity costs. Sean, have you seen this play out in the field? Absolutely. You know, attic vents are essential for roof lifespan and for lowering your interior living temperatures and making your upstairs more comfortable. So with that, we found it's a challenging subject because we find most attics aren't ventilated properly. So we get involved in the project. We are turning around that system and fixing it. And first, what you have to do is kind of identify what's wrong with it. You know, diagnose the existing attic and start to find out what's going on. How can we fix it? Because I can guarantee almost every attic I've been in is not to to where it needs to be. So from there, we start to evaluate, what are we going to do? Got to pop up in the attic. We got to find out what's going on and got to take a look around the house. But as the as more you've been doing this, you start to kind of get an idea for what's going on when you see the condition of the roof. You get some yes. feedback from a homeowner. Um, you can kind of see the existing condition of the shingles. You can kind of pick up a lot of things from experience, having been doing it a long time. But getting in the attic never hurts. Yes. So with, uh, in Kansas City, we get a lot of contrast in temperature. So we'll get really hot summers, and then we'll get really cold winters. So we're kind of the testing ground for a lot of product, material, you know, all these different changes that we go through here. So yes, we get a lot of moisture issues, you know, because we're right here in the middle. We're going to get ice dams. We're going to get extreme heat. We're going to get wind-driven rain, tornadoes, hail. So we can get it all. So from the standpoint of a testing ground, we're pretty good to kind of uh, go through all of the different um, challenges there are with attic ventilation. Great. Th- thank you, Sean. Thank you. Sean, what about – the physical condition of the shingles and the shingle warranty long term. Can you can you comment on those? Yeah, I mean, recently I've been looking at a lot of roofs that are around 10, 15 years old. Okay. And they aren't properly ventilated. And mm-hmm. the south and west sides are extremely deteriorated. <laughs> and I kind of chalk that up to the lack of the ventilation. Like definitely a lack of intake. There's probably other things in the attic I can't 
fee. But with that, um, if homeowners are expecting to get a long-term or a lifetime warranty without addressing the attic ventilation properly, yes. I see that's really challenging. I really think the expectations for the homeowner on the lifespan of the roof matches with the sure start or the what you call warranty coverage period from each manufacturer. So each manufacturer has a lifetime warranty, but they have a 10-year or a 15-year 100% non-prorated period. That tells me that that's how long they expect the roof to last. It's about 10 or 15 years. So basically what we can do from there is extend roof life. If you can have an adequate or an abundance of intake, make sure that your system is balanced. Get a good exhaust technique. Make sure we don't have any mixing systems and go through all the little checklists that we do, insulation and all these other things. Um, that'll definitely make a huge difference, but yeah. Okay. Thank you, Sean. Yeah. Sean, you mentioned moisture already in your market in Kansas City. I'd like to talk a little bit deeper about moisture. Our listeners may not realize that as occupants of the house, we're generating two to four gallons of water vapor per day when we cook, shower, clean, run the dishwasher, breathe, perspire. If we have pets, if we hang dry clothes indoors, any firewood that we store indoors, and if we have indoor plants, all of this can contribute to generating moisture. Well, during the winter months, this moisture can become problematic if it reaches the cooler attics and it sticks around. I'm talking about wood rot, mildew perhaps even mold, certainly poor indoor air quality. Sean, can you discuss from your experience how you've seen attic ventilation either fight these problems or how the lack of ventilation perhaps contributed to the problems? Yeah, this is the next level in attic ventilation. Is becoming an expert about balanced attic vent systems, intake exhaust, and all those things about reducing interior living temperatures, that's heat buildup, that's, that's exhaust intake. The next level of proper attic ventilation and keeping it right is moisture because this is the thing every house i go to we roll around with these duck things in our truck because okay I'd say 90 to 95 percent of the homes we go to the tubing is ducted into the attic and so bathroom fans have got to be ducted out that moisture moisture is huge for us here but it's huge both seasons in the in the summer yes mass because um now the irony i've got girl take long showers. I'm finding a lot of these folks with kids and stuff, you know, they got a master bath. That's where they're taking the showers at, right? That master bath thing dumps out all that moisture into the uh, attic, you're done. So we're seeing a lot, almost every house we go to, we have to duct out that moisture properly. That's also something that we're pointing out in our pre-home attic inspection that's differentiating us from the other contractors is not only are we the expert when it comes to balance that event systems, evaluating what you have and making it better. But then we can also, I think in this next, let's say we've been doing attic ventilation for 15, 20 years. We're proficient at it. You step up your game and now you're a moisture eliminator guy in the attic. You know, you're trying to find out how does the moisture get in? How's it getting out? I go up in the attic. I'm seeing wet insulation. We see rusty mm -hmm. fasteners. We see the deck that's been affected from the moisture. So yes, it's a myriad of problems. And uh, we do roofs for a lot of friends, and so I get a, like I get talking real deeply and intricately into the ventilation stuff. And yes, that's their biggest thing. That's the biggest thing they always talk about is the moisture, and um, and usually it's in the winter when that, and that's what I call basically a sick attic. Is when you get up there and that and that uh, attic is dripping, or you can see the rust marks on the insulation. Yeah, you definitely got a sweating attic or a moisture problem with the attic. So definitely moisture is a big thing. So we've talked about heat buildup, moisture buildup. Then we've got ice dams to worry about in cold climates. An ice dam is a section of ice that forms on the roof near the eave, low on the roof, because of repeated thaw-free cycles of snow and ice. Improper attic ventilation, it, do it doesn't allow the uniform melting of the snow. So in time, it can cause water to back up underneath the shingles, potentially damaging the roof deck and interior walls and ceilings. Sean, can you share with us what you've seen specific to ice dams and why this should be a concern for homeowners in cold climates? Yeah, and as I've explained before, and we've talked many times, is yes. I've put these intricate attic vent systems in place on my own home. Yes. So I'm able to experiment 
and document and keep track of it 365 days a year. And so I've made some improvements to my advent system. I've changed out some of my intake vents. I've added intake vents. I've ducked it out stuff. I've got an externally baffled bridge vent. I've done all the things. So I'm able to watch it when it snows and see what kind of a snow load I carry to see how does that snow melt evenly? Does it hold the roof deck? So with all those things, I've been able to experiment, you know, and um, it's been interesting kind of following the progress and then comparing my roof deck versus my neighbors and seeing how quickly the heat escapes through the roof line. And that's where we're getting these ice stamps. Is. So from the, um, the, the lack of attic ventilation, it's kind of a telltale sign when you're in the winter time. You can definitely see where people's shortcomings are with attic vents. Now in Kansas City, we were a huge market for shake wood roofs. Okay. So what I found was when you switch roof systems, you create a whole nother problem. So with a wood roof, it naturally breathed and it was allowing kind of heat moisture to escape up through the roof. But when we put the decking on, you completely control and you change the environment in the attic. And a lot of folks didn't address that and it was part of the learning curve is um, you have to experience and go through these different aspects of attic ventilation to become proficient at it through experiencing it. Because what you're going to hear from the homeowner is this, it never ice dammed before. Mm -hmm. We had this roof for 20, 25 years and it was never a problem. You guys and, now all of a sudden. and now all of a sudden I got ice dams. Well, that's a key that you didn't put the attic vent system on quite right. And you can't control every aspect of ice damming because you've got insulation, you've got air leakage. You know, you're in a house that's built in the 50s or 60s and everything's up into the attic. So you, you got, got Mother these, Nature. <laughs> yeah, you got all these challenges. Like um, now the good news is, is with 2018 IRC, um, Codes are saying we got to put ice dam barrier material at and into 24 inches inside the wall wall. So if you're kind of adhering to code, you're converting homeowners to an ice dam barrier. But you can't be aloof and think that if you're going to put ice dam barrier material on and nail all through it, that you are keeping yourself free and clear of an ice dam problem if you don't address the attic ventilation situation. Right. So ice it's dam barrier alone won't prevent ice dams itself yeah, so right and as a contractor who's used ice barrier with intake and exhaust and all these things um yeah you definitely right. have to use all of the tools in your toolbox to help the homeowner fight attic heat buildup moisture ice dams, ice dams. All these different things. it's up to us to give the homeowner the tools and the options so we can get this stuff fixed that's a nice segue, Sean. Thank you for key point number two for the homeowner. And you've already touched upon it, but let's let's make it a little bit more formal. Key point number two for the homeowner is attic ventilation must be balanced. We've done case studies about the importance of balanced attic ventilation, which means an equal amount of intake airflow at the soffit, eave, or low on the roof's edge, combined with an equal amount of exhaust airflow at or near the roof's peak. And you've said this a couple times already, Sean, and thank you for it. Only when it's balanced can the system bring in cooler, drier air through the intake vents to flush out any warm, moist air through the exhaust vents. When it's balanced, the airflow can wash the underside of the roof deck, bottom to top, across the roof. And Sean, I know you have. Can, have you witnessed the differences between a roof with balanced attic ventilation and one without? Many times. I knew you. Many times than I can count. But with that said, recently we've had a couple. Um, I get called out for as being an attic ventilation expert. Uh, you know, through attending your seminars and being on top of different things and. Um, being just noted as someone that takes attic ventilation seriously. Yeah. Um, we're taking a look at all kinds of attics. I've seen some attics this summer that uh, weren't properly ventilated. <laughs> Numerous reasons. One that I went to was a house that had proper amount of exhaust. It had the they had the vinyl siding intake. Yes. We had the perforated panels. We got, you know, no clarification on what's underneath. And the summer call was it super hot in my attic. I got ridge vent what's going on you know and, and i got all this perforated intake it should be working but we're not getting any air you know it's super hot in the attic so i get up there it's 30 degrees hotter than it was outside so double what you would expect as a homeowner you know about 15 degrees maybe all right 30 degrees it, it was 100 degrees out it was 130 in the attic the gable louvers 
were not covered, but they were infl- they were dust infiltrating. So they had uh, the dust was clogged up all the screen. Okay, so I'm in the attic. It's 130 degrees. I take that screen off of the gable louver. Huge vacuum sucking air comes in. You could just tell instantly it was starved for intake. Yes, so it was a huge key. So I get down out of the attic. I took them the screens that are completely uh, dust infiltrated, and then we. And so the homeowner actually was pretty excited. He goes, wow, you fixed my problem. He goes, you took the screens off my gable louvers. Now my gable louvers are working, buddy. Thank you. I was like, no, sorry. Not no quite. Here. Not you got to close off your gable louver, <laughs> which he felt was working great. And then we had to address the intake soft yeah. situation properly. Cut out the yes. soffit and put on a, you know, the best fully vented panel that you can find from a, a, a siding contractor. So that was an interesting story. It just happened a couple weeks ago. But. I was going to mention, because I've listened to some of the other uh, airing it out episodes, and it is important to get in the attic, you know, but with COVID, it's, it's less possible, you know, right. the opportunities are less. So you almost have to become in tune and dialed in to what the problems are and what the characteristics are, and what the crime scene looks like on the roof and around the house. And if you can start to kind of get a feel for what's going on and what's wrong, from just doing the outside inspection. Yeah, you can get in the attic. You're not always going to be able to get in the attic, but there are tons of giveaways on the outside of the house that are tells like a poker game, where you can tell that the attic is failing. The decking's waving. The intake vents are clogged. Like One of the new things I've added in the last year is an extremely high-powered flashlight to shine up into the soft vent location. So okay. I can see the slot cut size, and if it's dust infiltrated or if it even has a slot. Cut. From the outside, yeah. I like that. Yeah. So a really high power flashlight can show you as the contractor, you've got clogged insulation in the intake. If the intake vents are painted over or whatnot. You know, and then one little tip thing I have been using for the last year is this. If I'm if I'm turning the homeowner's system around and putting on external baffles, doing the intake, balancing the system, putting everything I can into the roof job, make their attic ventilation as best it can be. Right. But their outside air conditioner unit is completely clogged with dust infiltration. It is very hard to make a huge impact with the homeowner. So a lot of us are doing storm damage assessments. When we go around the house and we're looking for things for the hail damage anyway. We're looking at the AC unit on every house to see if it's got little dents and dings, right? Paul, you went through this in Dallas, right? So with that, if I notice that the exterior condenser unit is extremely clogged and dust infiltrated and whatnot, what I've been finding is after we do the roof and I've cleaned the air conditioner extensor unit from all the dust and infiltration and the interior, you know, their furnace filters clean. Oh, they're calling back and they're saying, wow, I'm, I'm seeing two, 300 percent improvement in my attic vent system because – if I do everything I do, but I can't clean their exterior condenser unit, you know, in our area, it gets really dust infiltrated. Or you mow right. your yard, you know, all that stuff gets in the older units. You know, some of the newer ones, they've got a better design. You can't really get that dust in there. But I've been to houses where we did everything right, and I couldn't figure it out. And I go outside, and, you know, there's an inch of uh, dust on the outside of the condenser unit. We take the hose, and we spray it all off. That's so great. Cleaning, cleaning the exterior condenser unit is a new little tip from the expert that I hadn't been doing in the previous years. That I've been and now you are. Making an impact. Yeah, it's making an impact. I like it. Thank you, Sean. It's a great tip. Thank you. Sean, in our testing, if the exhaust vents do not have the correct quantity of intake vents feeding them incoming air, not only will they not work effectively, we've seen instances in which the exhaust vents pull air from a nearby exhaust vent. In the case of box vents, or wind turbines, or from themselves, in the case of ridge vents. We don't want an exhaust vent turning into an intake vent because that could mean they'll bring in weather elements into the attic. One thing we should point out for listeners is if you cannot get a perfectly balanced system, 50% intake, 50% exhaust, for whatever reason, complex design, it just won't, well, it's not physically possible on that roof. It's okay to have too much intake. So if you can't be 50-50 perfectly balanced, it's okay to be bottom heavy. I like to call it bottom heavy, intake heavy. You can't have too much intake. In fact, excess intake turns into exhaust on the leeward side of the house. But the reverse, the reverse 
of too much exhaust is never desirable. And, and we just try and emphasize that to folks. 50-50 plan A, plan B, be bottom heavy with more intake. Now, Sean, you've already mentioned this third tip, and I'm going to dig a little deeper with you, please. Key point number three for the homeowner, ridge vents are the most efficient attic exhaust vent option. And while it's true, there are multiple options for exhaust. An air vent makes just about every option out there. But if the homeowner's roof is suitable for a ridge vent, we believe a ridge vent would be the best choice. And I'm going to spend just a couple of minutes exploring that. There, there are five categories for the benefit of our listeners of attic exhaust, five, five types, wind turbines, gable and louvers, individual box vents, power fans, and ridge vents. Those are the five. And there are circumstances to use any of these five, depending on the attic size, the roof's shape or its configuration. But if the choice is between using a ridge vent or one of the other four types, air vent is always going to recommend ridge vent. Here's why. Only ridge vents deliver a continuous flow of air because they are the only exhaust vent installed interruption free along the entire horizontal peak of the roof. Every other category of exhaust is spaced apart along the roof, leaving pockets or gaps where the airflow is either skipped or reduced. As a result, ridge vents are the only exhaust vent that fully vents the entire, that's the key, the entire underside of the roof deck from low to high in the attic. Additionally, there's no moving parts to malfunction. You're not using any electricity. And cosmetically, because ridge vents are low profile with matching shingles installed on top, they're just about invisible from the ground looking up at the roof. Ridge vents blend in rather nicely with the beauty of the roof compared to the other four categories of exhaust. Now, Sean, I, I follow you on Facebook, Epic Exteriors. I, I see what you post. So I, I, I know what you're going to say, but please, for the benefit of our listening audience, what do you see and what do you hear from homeowners when the choice is other types of exhaust or a ridge vent? And the roof is a candidate for a ridge vent. Well, we always lean for ridge vent on a house that's a candidate for ridge vent. It's almost a no-brainer. Um, for us, having put ridge vent on for 20-plus years, we've seen the evolution in the ridge vent um come along so really um it's, it goes back to the application you got you have a good product which you have airvent's got a great applicator friendly easy product to install we've got lots of varieties of products to install we've got rolled we've got straight we've got um, low profile thicker we've got internal filters no fil i mean we've got all the options that we need at the contract right. but definitely ridge vent and going edge to edge and making it blend in and look as natural as possible is one of the signature looks that we go for at Epic Experiences. When we put the roof on and you drive by, one of the big compliments used to be is, oh, we don't see, we can't even see the roof fence. Uh, watch out, Epic doesn't even put the roof fence on. <laughs> 15 years ago, you know, 15, 20 years ago, when Ridgemont was a new kind of, you know, a new trending thing, um, people were just switching from box vents and turbines. You know, it was the, the genre was just starting to switch. And people yeah. would say, watch out for those guys. They don't put any vents on. Just you skipping the vents. Biggest, absolutely. That was the biggest compliment we could ever get. And I would tell them, ooh, thank you. That's exactly what we're looking for. You know, if you can develop a recipe for attic ventilation success and implement it into your business, pass it on to the homeowners, you're definitely going to separate yourself from the other contractors in your area. And ridge vent is the way to go. And if you can't use ridge vent, then you need to use the steps and the different tricks in the toolbox with you know, the certain type of box fence or power fan, but those are all have their own different challenges and, and they're all good and bad. So if we can try and use Ridge Vent, it has the best looking exterior look and it provides the most and it allows me to do more in the attic and provide the consumer more. And I've just seen it. And, and the one thing I love about the Ridge Vent is this, is everything's tested at five miles an hour. It's windy here. You know, we yeah. have hot, windy days, and it's just amazing how more effective the attic vent is when you have enough intake, and you can get those air exchanges, and you get some great wind going. 
Yes. Uh, yeah, it absolutely just amplifies the amount of exhaust capability you can get. I can't get that with a box set. I can't get that with a turbo. No. That's yeah. the only vent that will increase its effectiveness when the wind blows more. I, it's amazing. I, Sean, like this, this, this is a perfect thank you. you you've uh, introduced the next topic I wanted to visit about, which is unique to uh, a ridge vent is the external wind baffle, which is allowing it to enhance its airflow, which is what you're noticing in Kansas City. And it's it's everywhere. It's a little lip or it's a wing running along the length of the ridge vent on both sides of the vent. And it allows the wind to literally hit the vent, deflect up and over the vent, and create low pressure above the vent openings to enhance its exhaust airflow capabilities. It also helps to deflect weather elements away from the vent and the attic. Now, our listeners who are not familiar with this concept, they're, they're welcome to Google the term the Bernoulli effect if they'd like, and it's spelled B-E-R-N-O-U-L-L-I. The Bernoulli effect is what gives lift to an airplane. And we have a pretty cool video on airvent.com demonstrating the Bernoulli effect if you want to check it out. And Sean, you've just, you've just perfectly uh, introduced it. So thank you. I know you have firsthand experience with non-externally baffled ridge vents compared to externally baffled ridge vents. And you, you, you already answered it. Uh, we're, not, we're not here to name brands, but if you find one with an externally baffled ridge vent, it's going to give you that enhanced performance. And there's there's many out there. It's not just the air vent. There's many out there. But you want the external baffle. Yeah, I mean, you're talking to a guy that used to put on the rolled non-external baffled ridge vents in the 90s. We put When I started, asphalt roofing wasn't so much a thing. It was more wood roofing in our market. Okay. You, off a wood roof, you put back on a wood roof. So what we would do is we would incorporate rolled ridge vent products into the cedar roof application at the ridge line. Ridge venting wood shake roofs with non-externally baffled ridge vents. And then years go by and you see you go back, you start to you look at different things and wow, what a uh, what a cluster. You know what I mean? It catches everything. It doesn't uh, let the exhaust happen like it should. But once you went to an externally baffled product, you never went back to a rolled product again. That was where it ended. And so never again would you choose a non-baffled, uh, you know, externally baffled product. Now it just became, which externally baffled ridge vent do I want to work with? In fact, I just saw on TV, they were talking about with the plane, they said the, the Bernoulli effect, you know. Uh, yeah. That's the effect that forces the airplane to rise, but there was the pressure acting effect. And so it was the same thing with your external baffle. I found that interesting. It's it's the Nick. It's the pressure forced against the external baffle that creates the sucking effect. And like we described, the windier it is, the more of a sucking effect you get. But keep in mind, without enough intake, your externally baffled ridge vent could ingest air from itself. Yes, it can. Yes, it and can. That there would be a problem. Yes, it would. Yes, it would. Thank you, Sean. Thank you. Sean, our fourth key point for the homeowner is do not mix exhaust vent types. And if it's okay with you, I'm going to keep this one a little bit short because we've already dedicated an entire episode of a, a of another another episode of a podcast on this topic. But it's important enough that I added it to this one. We don't want to mix because if you mix, you're confusing the flow of air. It could lead to inefficient airflow and weather infiltration. One type will be the primary exhaust vent, while the second type could turn into intake, bringing in air and weather along the way. The, the formal term is called short-circuiting. This question birthed are found in the field segment. <laughs> this yeah. was the whole genesis to this thing, was the mixing of different attic vent systems. And it's extremely common, way more common than you would think. And if you follow Air Van on Facebook or any of their other social media, you'd see there are dozens of folks every week and month that post attic vent nightmares where we've got ridge vent combined with power vents, combined with turbines, combined with box vents. Sometimes it's the homeowner's fault. Sometimes it's the contractor's fault. Sometimes it's a, it's both where the homeowners yeah. are talking to the contractor into putting on additional vents just to create and alleviate problems that they thought they had. So. It's an interesting myriad, but it creates a lot of opportunity for us in the contracting side to correct it. Now, I think the evolution has been 
with um, gable louvers. You know, I just find that gable louvers and um, they're a sneaky little guy because you're not thinking about that becoming your short circuiting. Right. And I see the other next evolution of short circuiting is mixing ridge vents on different planes. So if the ridge lines are, say, more three to five feet apart, they're going to act differently. And the lower ridge line is going to become the intake vent. And so now you're short circuiting the attic. And, you know, we've been in the attic and we've partitioned attics and it's no fun. But if you've got a large attic that's challenging with multiple ridge lines, ridge line is the go to. But you better get in the attic and make sure that you're not short circuiting and creating yes. an issue. And so not mixing two different styles of vents. Gosh, I guess you would think that that's a no brainer. But because of the found in the field segment, we see that every week. But I, you know what? I'm going to lie. We love that. It's a gem. I mean, just look at those pictures. Oh, it's something else. I mean, anyway, it's, it's part of the best time of my week is watching that found in the field. Segment. I'm going to lie. It, it, it's, it's, a, it's a mixed bag for, for us at Airven. You know, we, we like the photos and we like the participation, but we shake our head that it's happening. But there's companies like you that fix it and get it corrected. And slowly we're getting the word out and consumers are seeing it. So thank you for commenting on mixing. Uh, we're in the home stretch here, Sean. It's our fifth and final key point for the homeowner. And this is the point. Just because you didn't have correct attic ventilation before doesn't mean you don't need it now. Sean, I know you and many roofing contractors across North America who have talked with me during the seminars and during the year just corresponding what do you say to homeowners in response to this line of thinking? I didn't have it before. Why do I need it now? What, what's your what's your response to that, John? Well, there's a couple there. I mean, for us, we put on extended warranties. So the manufacturer is going to want us to fulfill the manufacturer's warranty requirements. So that's one. I got to fulfill the extended warranty requirements. So that's why we're going to do it now. Two, uh, 2018 IRC code. You know, we've got to refer to R806 now, which is the section that refers to proper attic ventilation. So, yes, code says, and in my municipalities here in town, there's inspections on the roof. And that's one of the things that they're talking about. In fact, it's the second listed thing, uh, R806. They want to see ice and water shield, then R806. Almost every municipality in my area is inspecting for 1150. So they're getting hard. It's not that, that, that's the ratio, right, Sean? Absolutely. They're going for the real hardcore 1-150, one, one not 1-300. So I think that's another thing. And some of what I'm also telling homeowners is it's 2020. What do you think roofing technology is going to be like in 2035 or 2040? Way more advanced than it is now. Photovoltaic, solar, solar reflected granules, heat reduction. That's going to be a huge thing. So do everything you can now in 2020 to make your attic and roof as as efficient as possible because you know the technology and all the things are changing because 15 to 20 years ago look at what we were doing it's made tons of evolutions and it's way better now so what i'm telling homeowners is get, get the best properly balanced attic exhaust vet system with intake get your duct work done get your insulation to code get everything addressed now and this is just going to help you in the long run when it's 2035 or 2040. With roofing technology has made a couple evolutions. You won't be so far behind. I yes. see homeowners 15 to 20 years ago, they got three or four fresh air vents, no intake, limited insulation. You know, they're stuck in the past. They're, they're, they're needing some huge help. So if it's 2020 and you're making a decision and you're just putting back on box vents, it's not good enough. You know, and you're no. not addressing the intake vents. It's not doing the consumer any good. Not only are you not fulfilling your manufacturer's warranty, the consumer is not going to be in a good place 10, 15 years from now. They're going to be facing another re-roof. And I've seen that in my own area in the last, say, a couple months from houses that were all done in 2011 and they're nine years old and they're failing inspection from, a from when the houses go to market. So the houses go to sale. The home yep. inspector says, sorry, the roof is toast because all the rock is coming off. And I get up there and I look and I'm like, Whew. it's excessive wear due to heat buildup and the lack of attic ventilation. And here we are. It's only nine, 10 year old roof and a homeowner's re-roof. And it's the box vents. It's the 750s. It's the slot cut. I take off the box vent. It's just a shoddily cut hole with a hatchet. 
it's not a straight slot cut, you know, so you don't even know what you're inheriting when you get these jobs. But um, closing off the old box vents holes and then putting on a properly cut slot cut and then put on a great externally baffled ridge vent product with proper intake, making sure you're balanced. Don't short circuit the system. Sean, that's going to wrap up our episode. I want to thank you very much for your time today. We very much appreciate your generous sharing of tips, expertise, and your perspective. you have any final words you want to share for our listeners before we well, sign off? We love AirVent. No, nah, you don't have to say that. <laughs> I know we do. AirVent University, that's our baby. We love it. The found in the field stuff. It's great. Thanks. So we'll just keep contributing and help uh, anything I find in the field. I'll send your way and Thank we'll you, just Sean. keep in touch. It. Thank you, Sean. It means a lot to me. You're you're, you're helping us spread the word. You're, help, you're helping us uh, further educate the industry. You're always very, very available. And I want to say thank you very much on behalf of everybody in your event and our listeners. We thank you. And that's going to wrap up our episode. When you have a homeowner willing to hear you out about attic ventilation's importance, be sure to drive home these points that Sean and I just reviewed. And that'll wrap up this episode. Please leave a review on iTunes if you'd like. Be sure to let us know if there's a topic you'd like us to cover in a future episode. Maybe you'd like to be a guest on a future episode like Sean was a guest today. Drop us a note on the podcast page of our website, airvent.com. And please come back for more Airing It Out with Airvent. I'm Paul Chelsea. Thanks for listening, everybody. Goodbye.